Hi, I'm Steve Sandler, the founder of AEI Systems, a company that specializes in modeling, analysis, and simulation. A large part of our focus is on analog and power electronics, though we support RF and instrumentation as well, primarily for the high reliability arena. In our business, we are frequently called on to assess and troubleshoot system level issues, many of which are related to the Power Distribution Network, or PDN. The causes of the customer issues are generally covered in this very short list. In previous videos, we have discussed time domain measurements, such as those involving the oscilloscope measurements of switch node waveforms and ripple. In this video, we'll delve further into time domain measurements of power supply signals, and as there are certain measurements which we can only observe in the time domain, and certain issues which are most easily deciphered in the time domain. Some specific examples of time domain measurements are glitches, turn on overshoot, as well as switch and synchronous MOSFET timing. As we saw in a previous video, these effects can cause issues with both EMI and also stability. We often get into trouble measuring in the time domain, and this is often due to the oscilloscope's linear time scale and linear amplitude scale, as we will see shortly. Other problems encountered with time domain measurements are due to the use of trace averaging or incorrect probes. Using instruments with insufficient bandwidth and or sample rate for the measurement can also lead to measurement errors or cause us to miss important details. The bandwidth required today for measuring power supply waveforms is 1 GHz with a 10 Giga sample sampling rate, but those figures represent the absolute minimums. If you're buying a new scope and you want it to last a few years, then an instrument with 2 to 4 GHz bandwidth and 20 to 40 Giga samples per second is strongly recommended. Here's a great example of a glitch. Using a high-speed scope with advanced and multi-stage triggers, Images like the switch node waveform of a synchronous buck regulator become quite easy to catch, and we do catch quite a few. There are quite a few interesting points in this measurement. First, we can see the duty cycle jitter from the two adjacent pulses. It would require more pulses to see if the jitter is actually a subharmonic oscillation. The device under test, or DUT, is a current mode controlled device, so that is a possibility. We can also see synchronous MOSFET misfires, culminating in a substrate conduction, which latches the regulator's substrate parasitic SCR. The regulator eventually does restart once the current in the SCR sufficiently decays. We can also see the natural response of the switch node from the ringing at the end of the waveform. This output voltage waveform is obtained from a DSP-based buck regulator tuned for optimum response to a transient. It is very well behaved in this view, which is taken at a time scale of 2 milliseconds per division. And despite the scope being AC coupled, the image is clear enough for us to see the transient response recovery, indicating good transient response. The phase margin is close to 60 degrees, evidenced by the very slight ring back, which is not at all evident at 70 degrees. This measurement is the same DSP regulator taken at the same time as the previous image, but displayed on a 200 millisecond per division time scale. This is one of the drawbacks of the linear time scale. These voltage excursions are at 200 millivolts per division. The very nice transient response image is not even visible in this screen. The time scale issue is that we would not see these voltage excursions unless we knew to look for them. Here is yet another image showing a measurement of the output voltage of a linear regulator on a somewhat higher performance scope, a Tektronix MSO 5104. We can clearly see the step load response and ringing, indicative of poor stability margin. We are sampling at 5 mega samples per second, which is reasonable for the 50 microsecond per division time scale and the limited memory we have in the scope. However, this is the same image at a different time scale of 5 microseconds per division at a 20 mega sample per second sample rate. The LDIDT spike is a bigger concern than the ringing, 
and this spike wasn't even evident in the previous screenshot. In fact, if this load step was performed with an electronic load, it would still likely not be evident due to the slow rise and fall times of the electronic load. This is one reason that we prefer to troubleshoot in-system using the system as the load. If and when we need to inject the stimulus, high-speed current injectors such as the J2111 or J2112 are fast enough to reveal most of these common issues. Using an even faster scope in this measurement, we can clearly see the LDIDT spikes. But notice that now we can't really see the control loop response due to the linear amplitude scale. Increasing sensitivity so that we can see the spike might overrange the ADC. We need very high sample rate and very high bandwidth, which we have, and yet now we still can't see the whole picture. We do have a few options. Since the load step in this case is generated using a current injector, we can reduce the edge speed of the current injector to reduce the LDIDT spike while retaining the fidelity of the control loop performance measurement. We could also use the scope's digital filter capabilities, or ERES, to remove the spike while retaining the control loop response. Another option is to use two measurement windows, one at the scale shown to see the spike, and the other one at a zoom view of the ringing. We see waveform anomalies or bloopers like these frequently, so they are not rare events. We'll show you just a few for fun. Here we have two measurements obtained from an RH-137 negative voltage regulator. On the left is a plot of the regulator's output impedance, and in the lower right-hand corner we have the corresponding oscilloscope measurements of the regulator's output current and voltage. In previous videos where we discussed the implications of bandwidth, phase margin, and gain margin, it was usually assumed that there was just one value for each. However, there is no rule that says that we can only have one zero crossing, one phase margin, or one gain margin. And in this impedance plot, we see evidence of at least three zero crossings, each of which presents poor stability. Taking a closer look at the output in the time domain allows us to see the multiple frequencies simultaneously. We could distinguish them a bit better in the spectrum domain, but even in the time domain, we can clearly see the presence of multiple frequencies. If we go back to the synchronous buck regulator with the parasitic SCR tripping, which we discussed in the first measurement example, we can uncover even more quirks in converter operation by looking at the time domain. This image is a zoomed out measurement of the converter's switch node waveform. In this image, we can see the shutdown period and also that there is an additional missing pulse during the recovery period. The impact of these oddities can be seen clearly in the MI and in the ripple. Both reflect signals predominantly at 23 kHz, despite the 2.5 MHz switching frequency of the converter. This image, also taken from the same converter, shows other odd operational modes. In this case, the converter is missing several pulses on a regular basis. The missing pulses result in movement of the zero order hold to a lower frequency during these periods. The end result is that the missing pulses will impact output ripple, EMI, and stability performance of the regulator. For those interested in learning more about how to make and interpret time domain measurements, see the references listed here. And if you have any questions about the information presented in this video, please email me at steve at pigotest.com. Thank you.